Well, hello, hello. How are you doing this Tuesday? My name is Crystal Sky, and if you're anything like me, you find yourself drawn to true crime cases. So let's go ahead and talk about one today. If you are also drawn to true crime, and you want to feel better about your makeup skills at the same time, you should absolutely like, subscribe, and let's hang out together every other Tuesday where I will take a deep, deep look into a true crime case while slapping on the old clown paint. So how are y'all doing? I hope y'all doing well, and I hope you are ready for the case that we are going to dive deep into. It's probably going to be a four maybe five-parter? We'll see. Um, but th there's a lot to get into. Today and for the next few weeks, we will be discussing the case of Dana Yule. Have y'all heard of this? He's a little trust fund little bitch who killed his family for the money. Yeah, it is a fascinating infuriating case, and it took years to bring this little a-hole down. This was another requested case from at hey, hey, you. you threw, like, I think three cases at me. You suggested the Bellevue murders, which we covered, and then you suggested this case that as soon as I learned, like, the premise, I'm like, oh, what? Like, I love seeing uh, rich people get what they deserve, you know? So there was so much information on this case because it happened in Fresno, California, and it was a huge, huge case. So there's so much information. Actually, like, for real, as I'm recording this right now, I'm still not even completely 100% done with my research. Like, I'm at the very, very tail end, and I just keep up digging up more that I'm like, oh my god, this is great. Um, I did read a book for this case. It's called Catch Me If You Can by Craig Hanadel. Um... We will get to into it at the very, 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 very end of uh, this case, but this is hands down one of the worst true crime nonfiction books I have ever read. I have all kinds of examples of why I don't like this book. Uh, again, get into it at the end. And yeah, I read through it so you don't have to, so don't you worry. It, reading this book, really, I'm just like, dude, no wonder Anne Rule was like the true crime author. Like, I have yet to come across a book that is as well-written, researched, empathetic, and, and real as an Anne Rule book. I love Anne Rule, all right? But yeah, this, mm-mm, mm-mm, not, not very good. Not very good. Again, I, I'll get into my review at the very, very end. But I mean, it wasn't all bad in the book. Like, there's a lot of good information. There's just, I don't know. It feels like the author wanted to write a fiction book, and they didn't realize, like, this is a non- fiction. This is a true story that happened to real people. These aren't characters in a fucking book, you know? Um, and that actually leads me to my uh, my, my warnings. Um, there will be lots of cussing in this one, all right? We're, we're going to be dropping bombs. I may even drop the C word, which, yeah, some some people get really up, uppity about it. But yeah, just um, be forewarned. I may be dropping cunt here or there because that is what Dana Yule is. All right. So with all of that preamble, let's get into it because there's there's just so much, guys. There's so much. So Dana James Yule was born on January 28th, 1971 in Fresno, California. His mother was Glee Ethel Mitchell Yule and his father was Dale Allen Yule. And Dana was the youngest of two children. He had an older sister named Tiffany. Now, these this is the family we will be discussing. So let's let's really get into the Yule family and who they were. We will start with the patriarch of the Yule family. So Dale Allen Yule was born October 11th, 1932 in Oxford, Ohio. His father was an Ohio farmer named Eric Austin, excuse me, Austin Burt Yule. And his mother was a school teacher named Mary Rebecca Thompson Yule. And uh, she had actually graduated from uh, Kent University, which, right, like that's, that's kind of a an accomplishment back in, in this day, you know. I know um, Jeff, my husband, his uh, his grandmother had a master's degree. And that was back in like, yeah, like right after like Great Depression days. So yeah, I mean, 
pretty cool. Now, Dale had an older sister named Betty and three younger brothers. So he was the oldest son. His brothers were Richard, Ben, and Roland, although Roland went by Dan. So that is what I will be referring to him as, Dan. Now, the Yule children, as a lot of farm families, right, toiled from sunup to sundown, working the farm, helping their father maintain it, right? It was a 250-acre farm that uh, Dale's father had purchased in 1937. Now, from the time that he was a very, very young boy, Dale had a fascination with planes and flying. He he loved it as far back as he could remember. And even though, right, most farm boys, especially farm boys in this era, rarely ever made it to, you know, educate high school education, let alone higher education, Dale managed to go to college. He went to Miami University in Ohio. While there, he studied aeronautical engineering. And in 1954, he graduated with a degree in aeronautical engineering. Right after college, Dale, still, you know, really fascinated and obsessed with flying, decided to join the Air Force. And in the Air Force, he managed to become a pilot, which from my understanding is actually a pretty big deal. I've talked to uh, several people who joined the Air Force specifically because they wanted to learn to be a pilot and learn to fly, and they never even got that chance. But Dale did, which is pretty, pretty awesome. And while he was in the service and, you know, got his pilot's license, learned to fly and all that, it is said that he was assigned to elite duty. Um, apparently, he got to ferry around like different top Air Force officials and what and whatnot, like all around the country. And he got to fly around in a King Air turboprop plane. I don't know if that's like a big fancy plane or whatever, but yeah, that that was the the plane he got to fly around in. In 1957, so he's still in the Air Force, Dale was assigned to Phoenix, Arizona, and it is in Arizona where he would meet his future wife Glee. And now, let's let's get into the matriarch of the Yule family. So Glee Ethel Mitchell was born on January 13th, 1935 in Chicago, Illinois. Her father was James John Mitchell, and her mother was Glee Irvin Mitchell, and her mother was known as Big Glee. So that's probably how I will distinguish uh, them in, in when I, as I cover this case. Good Lord, I can't talk. That is how I will be referring to Glee's mother as I cover this case. So we have Glee, who is the matriarch of the Ewell family, and her mother, Big Glee. Now, unlike Dale, right, who came from, I mean, almost abject poverty, right? Like working a farm, especially in the 30s, not easy work. Glee had the total opposite upbringing. She was born with a lot of wealth and privilege because her mother had inherited a bunch of like oil stock from her father, who was a physician. Glee's father was an instructor at a Chicago squash club. And yeah, he did not come from the same type of like wealth and prestige that uh, her mother did. Now, growing up, it is said Glee always excelled in school, always enjoyed it, always got really good grades. She was very, very smart. She would spend summers with family in Oklahoma. And it is said because Glee was so personable and outgoing, she had a large social circle. She was just one of those people that loved people, you know? And I'm not gonna lie, sometimes I wish I was like that. Like, I'm so introverted, guys. Like, ugh, talking with people just exhausts me. Like, it really does. Now, after high school, Glee enrolled at the University of Arizona, and she would graduate in 1957 with a degree in Inter-American Studies. Glee was also fluent in Spanish. While she was in college, she was elected president of her sorority, the Pi Beta Kappa, and it is when she is uh, here attending school that she met Dale at a party. Now, after she had graduated from the University of Arizona, Glee uh, went back for graduate work. While Dale, at that time after Glee had graduated, he was done with his service in the Air Force, and he actually moved to Long Beach, California and got a job there. Specifically, he got a job at uh, Douglas Aircraft. So for a while, right, it was long distance. But even though it was long distance, it is said that Dale and Glee were very devoted to each other. They knew they were in it for the long haul. However, Dale found that he wasn't really enjoying his job at Douglas Aircraft. I'm not quite sure what his job entailed, but it is said that he wanted to be out actually flying the planes. So yeah, maybe he was stuck as more of like an administrative type of role or something, or maybe just fueling the planes. Not sure. But he wanted to be out there and actually fly. So in 1959, Dale moved to Fresno, California, and that's because he had gotten a job there. And in Fresno, Dale was able to sell private aircraft. And this was a profession and a job that suited him 
very, very well, which we will get into. Meanwhile, that same year, 1959, Glee, get this, Glee got a job with the CIA. Yeah, the CIA, and she was sent to Argentina. And there she was a Spanish translator. Uh, the book specifically said that she worked for the company. Uh, they put that in quotes uh, as a translator. So I'm not quite sure what that means, but yeah, I thought that was, I mean, that's, that's pretty impressive, man. Like, this is 1959. She's a woman on top of that. And like with the CIA, that's, that's wild. Now, Glee would end up working with the CIA for two years. And all that time, guys, all that time, Dale and Glee were still together. Like I said, they knew they were in it for the long haul. So long distance wasn't that big of a deal for them. But after two years with the CIA, Glee returned to the US and her and Dale married on December 28th, 1961. And they would end up, of course, settling in Fresno because it turns out Dale was a really good salesman. Specifically, he was really good at selling private aircraft. And this guy, man, he made boatloads of money. All right. Like not only did he, you know, he sell these aircraft for a pretty penny, but like, remember he got fat commissions off these sales. And he was like the top salesman. Now it is said one of the reasons Dale was so successful at selling private aircraft is because he knew who to sell to. He was really good at being able to sell to farmers, right? Not, not surprising considering his upbringing, right? Sorry, I just banged my brush on the table. So yeah, I guess what uh, Dale would do, right? Because it's Fresno. And in case you don't know, Fresno, lots of like farms and, you know, land and stuff. Like th it's like the farming area. All right. So I guess what Dale would do, right, is he would fly, you know, these, his, his private planes that he wanted to sell onto these farmers land and, you know, give them a pitch and be like, hey, man, like, I, I can, you know, I can sell you this aircraft. And uh, another thing that Dale really did is like, if you buy this plane for me today, I will personally teach you to fly at no extra charge. Yeah. And that worked for him, man. That worked for him. He was able to sell. He could sell water to a drowning man. So a top salesman who would end up working with uh, Dale um, a little bit later, but he would end up being with Dale for like 14, 15 years. He was a top salesman for him. His name was Robert Bob Purcell. And he described the kind of aircraft that they were selling. Quote, you weren't selling aluminum. It was the 250 miles per hour, 15,000 feet fun of flying, the romance, the scarf and goggles, power, ego. And that's, that's how, how Dale was just able to really sell, man. Like he had it all. In 1965, Dale went to work for Frank Lamb Aviation, again, still in Fresno. And here he continued being the top salesman, getting really fat commissions and checks. Like he really was able to build a lot of wealth. And on May 1st, 1967, the couple welcomed their first child, a daughter who they named Tiffany Ann Yule. Now, when Tiffany was very, very young, I don't know the exact age. I think she was either a baby or even like a toddler. Like she wasn't older than a toddler, I don't think. She was in a really bad car accident with glee. And I'm not sure what the like specifics are, but she ended up having to have a metal plate put into her head as like a young kid. And some people wondered if perhaps this accident didn't help shape Tiffany's personality a little bit. She was described uh, by one classmate who knew her, quote, Tiffany was the opposite of her mother, really quiet and very shy. She was extremely private, just very sweet, very lovely, a wonderful personality, but you had to really draw her out in conversation. Bob, uh, remember Dale's top salesman, uh, said that Dale thought the accident shaped his daughter's personality as well because she was so quiet and shy. Quote, Dale always said it slowed her down a little. He called her his imperfect angel. Now, all right, so here, here's where we get into stuff that I'm not a fan of Dale of. Now, Dale was described as, I'm sure a lot of men at the time were, as a typical chauvinistic, misogynistic pig, right? He thought women were second-class citizens. And I would love to, to, you know, I would have loved to ask and be like, wait, so, but like, what about your wife? Highly educated, worked for the freaking CIA, speaks another language fluently. Like, what about her? I don't know. Maybe he thought because she came from wealth, it was different. 
I don't know. But yeah, Dale was a typical sexist pig. And he thought, because he was sexist, that Tiffany, you know, was doubly handicapped. Not only was she a woman, but, you know, now she was like very shy. And for some reason, because she was so shy and private, a lot of people assumed she was like slow or had some sort of like I don't know, neurological or development issues. And I don't know, quite honestly, everything I read about Tiffany, it just seemed, I don't know, I feel like I, <laughs> I feel like I would get along with her because she was just a very quiet, introverted person. Like, I don't know, it just sounded like she was an introvert to me. I don't, I don't know. I, I love how it's always introverts are like, you need to talk more and stuff, but no one tells extroverts to just shut the fuck up. And Bob said, you know, because Dale had these views on women and that's what he thought of his daughter, that Dale would end up heavily, heavily favoring his daughter, especially financially, because he didn't think that she could make it on her on her own. Four years after Tiffany was born, the couple welcomed their second child, this time a son, on January 28th, 1971. And they named him Dana James Yule. However, right, so the same year that Dana is born, 1971, Dale's boss and the owner of Frank Lamb Aviation, Frank Lamb, I guess he also went by Frank Lambeccio? I don't know how if that's how you say the name, but yeah, he went by that name as well. But uh, Frank was arrested for drug smuggling. Yeah. And uh, when Frank was sent to prison, uh, Piper Aircraft, which like, I don't know, maybe that was like the parent company or something that owned Frank Lamb Aviation or something. Not quite sure how... Any of that works. If you know, let me know in the comments. But Piper Aircraft came to Dale and was like, yo, do you want to buy the business? And Dale jumped at this opportunity. As soon as he agreed to buy the business, though, he did go out and buy himself a gun. It was a nine millimeter Browning high power gun, a handgun, excuse me. And he bought two boxes of ammunition just in case like any of Frank's past or, you know, people he dealt with um, weren't a fan, you know, just in case. Now, apparently... Um, Frank was super, super burnt that Dale had done this. Like he thought Dale had like betrayed him or whatever. And he actually tried to uh, sue Dale in 1978, but he ended up losing that suit. And then I guess in that suit, Dale won like some rights to an air hangar and some other land that the paper said Frank agreed to buy. So I'm going to assume maybe that was like before his arrest or something. I'm not sure, but... Yeah, Dale, Dale won that in the suit. And then Dale's business, Western Piper Sales, was born. And it was vastly more successful than Frank Lamb um, Aviation ever, ever was. Frank tried suing Dale again in 1985. And this time, again, according to the article, the wording was weird. So I'm just going to like literally read you the wording that the article used. Um, it said Dale was able to force a bidding process on like um like a fueling area that Frank owned, or excuse me, that Frank had sold. And yeah, I was a little confused on that wording. Like, I'm not quite sure what that means, that he was able to force a bidding process on a uh, fueling area that Frank had sold. Like, so I don't know if that meant like, Dale was trying to buy it or what? Not sure. I'm not too bright. Now, apparently, all right, during this time, right, it was like, prime golden years in the aircraft industry. Like if you were going to sell planes or be involved with planes in any way, apparently in like the 60s, 70s and 80s, um, it was like the time to be in the industry. And during this time, yeah, Dale sold everything he could get his hands on. Another local airplane dealer named Chuck Wilson said of the Times, quote, business was outstanding. You couldn't get enough product. You could sell everything you could get your hands on and at a large margin. Now, Frank uh, from Behind Bars claimed that Dale was, quote, the most hated aircraft dealer in the world. And he also added again from Behind Bars, quote, Dale Yule did not respect you or thank you for anything you had done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not quite. <laughs> like, are you surprised that a guy convicted of a drug smuggling operation that he'd been doing for a while would have this viewpoint? But Bob Follett, he owned a nearby uh, like flying service. He said, you know, Dale wasn't hated, but quote, wasn't out there to be the most lovable. He was a no nonsense kind of guy. 
And Chuck ended up adding more to what uh, Dale's business acumen was, right? His, his attitude and his professional demeanor and how he ran his business. Quote, when a deal was done in the money exchange, Dale had a reputation of don't come back crying if you had a problem. He took a real tough line. That's your deal. and It doesn't get any better. And Bob, who, again, this is when he would work for Dale when Dale had Western Piper. Remember, I mentioned earlier, Bob was with him for like 14, 15 years, was his top salesman, I think, for several, several years going, like, consecutively. I'm not sure, but he was just described as, like, the top salesman. He said at times, yeah, Dale was very shrewd sometimes heartless. Quote, you'd have to call it a love-hate relationship. For 14 years, I'd go home every night tied up in knots because of him. He was the ultimate manipulator. He was the best there was at cowing you down, making you feel no good. Uh, Bob said that nothing was ever good enough for Dale. Like, Bob said that, like, he could come and tell Dale, like, oh my god, I just made this, like, huge sale. And Dale would just be like, what else have you done for me lately? Yeah. And, get this, when Bob got cancer and ended up in the hospital... Dickhead Dale canceled his health insurance. Quote, I asked him, how could you do such a thing? Hang me out like that. He said, it's not my fault that you smoke. He cared about more than money, but it was hard to see. He was his own favorite character. His hobby was counting money and he could never get enough. At one point, he had $10 million cash in the bank and he thought he was a poor man. We'd have customers come in, really rich customers worth more than $100 million and more. And he'd say to me, I shudder to think about his money. He was in awe. Yeah, yeah. I will get um, to my thoughts at the very very end of the case. But yeah, I I have some thoughts on this viewpoint. And apparently, um, there's a lot of proof in, you know, kind of what a dickhead Dale was when it came to to business at times. All you had to do was look in the uh, Fresno County uh, court records, and he was involved in a number of suits. A lot of these suits involved customers, and these customers claimed that Dale either, like, ripped them off, overcharged them, or what have you. A lawsuit in 1978 alleged that a plane that Dale and his company maintained had been flown an extra 800 miles. And this was according to the meter that like measures um, the flying miles, kind of like mileage in a car. And the suit alleged that the uh, meter had been tampered with. Now, all we know is that Dale did lose this lawsuit, but uh, court records did not indicate like if he admitted responsibility, if Western Piper did, or or what. Another lawsuit uh, was in 1982, and it was two men who claimed um, that Dale told them that Western Piper had sold a plane for them, but they could only that they only sold it for twenty one thousand dollars. And in the suit, the men alleged that eight days prior to telling them that Dale had actually sold the aircraft for twenty three thousand five hundred dollars. And so he had pocketed that extra, the difference in uh, in profit. Plus, he still got his commission for selling the plane. And I guess court records do not show how and if the, the case was settled. I don't know if it was settled out of court or, or what have you. Not sure. Um, I know later on, Dale ended up suing those same two men, claiming that they illegally recorded a, a conversation with him. And in July and August of 1987, Dale inadvertently got wrapped up in a federal case. And this wasn't really his fault. So there was a, a Fresno defense attorney. His name was uh, George Carter. And he was trying to allege that Dale and Western Piper were involved in a drug smuggling ring. So uh, this came up in a court case. Carter was representing a pilot, Robert Irving Barnes, and he was being charged with stealing a plane in order to uh, transport cocaine and marijuana from Mexico to the San Joaquin Valley. And so at his trial, Carter was trying to point the finger at Dale and Western Piper, probably to get heat off of his client. And he tried to point to them as like, oh, no, 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 they were actually the ones involved. Now, the authorities in the prosecution, like, dismissed Carter's, like, assertions because he he didn't have any proof or evidence of any of this. But Dale still had to go to court and testify. So uh, during his testimony, it was revealed that the stolen airplane in question had uh, had its flight meter show 50 hours fewer than when Dale had purchased that plane three months prior. He had, he had purchased it from a man in uh, Coalinga. 
Is that how you say that? I've never heard of that place. And then Dale had turned around and sold it to a doctor in Fresno. And I guess neither Dale nor Bob, who I think maybe also had to testify, they they couldn't account for the discrepancy. So I'm not sure if this is what Carter was trying to use to get suspicion off of his client or, or what. But he was trying to argue that Dale and this Fresno doctor that he sold the plane to were actually in cahoots with the drug smugglers and like let them use like his plane and land in exchange for, you know, payment. But he like provided no evidence that any payments were sent to to Dale. I don't know about Western Piper, but like, yeah, I mean, I get it. Like you're a defense attorney trying to, you know, defend your client, but like, yeah, you got you gotta have some sort of evidence or proof guy. And the prosecutor in this case, Carl Fowler, he called all of Carter's uh, insinuations and allegations, quote, a marvelous diversion. But in the end, Robert would end up being acquitted of all these charges. Another kind of like tangled up kind of business dealings that uh, Dale was involved with uh, in- involved a like residential and golf course development. It was called Brighton Crest. And the project was headed by Dale's younger brother, Ben. But I guess like yeah, this project, it was just plagued with, you know, problems and issues from the very beginning. And it absorbed millions and millions of dollars in cost from the investors. And most of these investors were from overseas. They were from the Philippines. And apparently some of these investors were Filipinos that were once tied uh, to their their uh, president, uh, Ferdinand Marcos. So yeah, I mean, I kind of believe it, right? Like, I'm sorry. I don't care what... Uh, era you're talking about, you don't make it in the United States of America without dicking over people. So I absolutely believe that Dale was probably a dickhead to some people. I'm sure he did rip off people and, you know, all that. I'm sure he got ripped off because that's just the nature of the business world, you know? The book was like all salty because a newspaper article had covered uh, Dale's business dealings, you know, when, when everything went down. And like, the book was like, oh, it was a character assassination because Dale's not here to defend himself, blah, blah, blah. Like, no, I'm not a fan of that. Like, if, I don't care if they're a victim, if they did some shady shit, I'm all about like, hey, let's talk about it, you know? That doesn't mean that they, you know, deserve what happened to them or anything. It's just not. Nah, these are these are the facts. So uh, as Dale, right, maintained his business, things are going well, and he became a multi-millionaire. And it is said that he was determined to, to build some wealth for his, his children. It is said that Dale did not want them to experience the hardships that he had, you know, being a farmer's son. And I guess um, all that money he was making from his business, he also like invested it. He bought like some land and, you know, made money from that. Did all kinds of like, yeah, stocks, investments and all that stuff and just accumulated more wealth. Meanwhile, so as Dale is uh, building his business and all that, Glee really, really dived into charity work and volunteer work and social work and that kind of stuff. I mean, we said this earlier, she's very outgoing and she was also very charismatic and very friendly. So she was, you know, she was pretty popular. Quote, you could talk to 100 people in Fresno and they'd tell you she was their best friend. And this was according to a very close friend of Glee's. Glee was also the assistant director of the Fresno Regional Foundation. And she was also affiliated with Valley Children's Hospital. She also uh, received a teaching credential from Fresno University in 1973. And dude, get this. In uh, 1985, the then Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court, his name was Marvin Baxter, he was a good friend of Glee's, and he helped her get a seat on the Board of Governors of the California Bar, and apparently uh, they, they, like, evaluated prospective judges and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And she was also a member of the state's Medical Quality Review Committee. So yeah, I mean, pretty, pretty impressive, especially on Glee's end, you know? And it is said, though the Yules, you know, had a lot of wealth, Dale and Glee themselves never really flaunted it all that much, you know what I mean? Um, they dressed kind of normally and didn't really flaunt their wealth too much. They didn't buy some fancy mansion up in the hills. They just bought a you know, I mean, still a mansion, but like a super nice uh, house in just like an, an upper upper crust neighborhood. And it is said that, yeah, they just, they didn't really like flaunt it as, as, you know, 
most rich people would. And at this point, yeah, like we were saying, right, they had substantial investments in the stock market and everything. They had uh, lots of farmland, which included uh, 320 acres of uh, fig and uh, pistachio trees in Merced County. And as such, right, the Yule children, Tiffany and Dale, got to experience an upbringing and childhood and life that, you know, few ever get. Um, it is said Dale continued favoring Tiffany. It is said her trust fund was even bigger than Dana's. Quote, he felt Tiffany couldn't make it in this world without help, but he told Dana, you're a man, you can make it on your own. And this was according to Bob, who, remember, worked with Dale, had lunch with him every day. So yeah, he, he kind of knew the dynamics a little bit. Yeah, isn't that, isn't that lovely? And Bob said, though Dale never like physically abused his children, he certainly, you know, emotionally abuse them, at least Dana. Quote, Dale wasn't physically abusive. He never hit his kids. I never heard him raise his voice, but he was mentally abusive. Nothing Dana did could ever be good enough. Dale bragged about him, but he abused him. He treated him like he treated me. Tiffany uh, attended and ended up graduating San Joaquin Memorial High School. And this was in 1985. And she was voted the shyest of the class, most shy. Again, I, it, I don't know. To me, it just seems like she was a little bit introverted and there is nothing wrong with that. And so I guess once she graduated, um, she went to Oregon to attend, like it was described as like a pretty small school. It was Linfield College in McMinnville, Oregon. And yeah, it was described as like, yeah, like the, the type of school for her, small, quiet and whatnot. Uh, once she graduated from there, she moved back to Fresno and then completed her undergraduate uh, degree at Fresno State University in accounting. So I wonder if Linfield was maybe like a community college or something, because it says she got her undergraduate degree at Fresno State. And then in 1991, Tiffany went back to Fresno State because she wanted to get a graduate degree. Now, as we said before, right, Tiffany was very demure and quiet and shy and just, just very, very sweet. Her brother, Dan, on the other hand, well, that's another, another story. Let's get into this little asshole. Dana was known to have a temper. And I'm sorry, the more I read about this kid, like, I'm sorry, he's a stereotype. He's a stereotype. He's your typical trust fund brat, born on third, thought he hit a home run. You know, he was, he was a little bitch. And even though his parents didn't flaunt their wealth, Dana certainly did. And he was also that typical uh, trust fund brat in that mommy and daddy covered up for his fuck ups. Mm -hmm. We'll get into it. Now, apparently, so before he could even get his driver's license, Dana would uh, consistently and often steal his father's Lincoln Continental. And Dale and Glee, even if they caught him, like didn't reprimand him didn't punish him or anything. And yeah, it is said the Yules just turned a blind eye to anything little Dana did. Bob claimed, quote, but that was really Glee's doing. She was compensating for what Dale was doing to him. Glee's friend, Rosalind Kershaw, said that, you know, Glee was just trying to be a good mother. Quote, there wasn't anything Dana wanted that he didn't get. Now, Dana was known uh, by his peers at school, um, you know, elementary, junior high, and high school as, quote, Mr. Wall Street, who was very competitive. And he walked around with, uh, with what he himself called his New York walk. Yeah, what a D-bag. He bragged that he could get by on only four hours of sleep. He showed up to school, again, going all the way back to grade school in Armani suits, Ralph Lauren polos, looking all prim and proper, carrying a little briefcase even. He was one of the first uh, on the block to get uh, an Apple Macintosh computer, owned a state-of-the-art like stereo system, had like a huge dresser drawer filled of like hundreds, probably thousands of dollars of like expensive men's cologne, some of which weren't even open. And he was, yeah, just the stereotypical trust fund brat who never had to work for anything, never earned anything, and never had to reap consequences in his life. It was said in the seventh grade, he flashed around $100 bills, and that's how he got people to like him, um, was buying lunch. 
and flaunting around all of his cash. What a loser. Uh, one friend that uh, Dana had in the seventh and eighth grades was named Sean Shelby. Quote, when I would go over to his house, his room was kind of a mess. I would kick some clothes over and I would see a hundred dollar bill on the floor. That used to blow me away. He said one time Dana saw him at the mall and Dana came up to him and in like a really bad, fake, phony English accent said, quote, are you low on funds today, Mr. Shelby? And handed him a $20 bill. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Like, like to me, like, I don't know. Doesn't that just scream insecure? You're so insecure and you're so much of a loser and have so little of a likable personality that you have to like flaunt your wealth around to get the kids to like you. What a loser. Now, it is said from the time he could practically walk, Dana was obsessed with wealth, money, power, all of it. He was obsessed. Some of his schoolmates eventually got tired of his antics. Like he would constantly brag that like, yeah, when mom and dad are busy, I can just like call a taxi to come pick me up after school. And like, it was just constant day in and day out. I I mean, I got tired reading about this little a-hole. I can't imagine having to attend school with him. And remember, he is going to school with up, with other like upper middle class um, um, kids probably had more money or wealth than some. But again, this wasn't like some public school. This was a private Catholic school. Now, one student who was uh, behind Dana by two years, and she didn't like know him personally, but she certainly knew of him. Her name was Gretchen Jones. And uh, she remembered like what she thought of Dana when she was in school. Quote, he was just so different and mature compared to other students. He didn't seem to be concerned about the usual like football games. Additionally, Additionally, and again, I feel like it speaks to the insecurity, Dana would make up weird, strange, outlandish lies about his parents. So I guess one time, right, Sean, Dana, uh, another classmate, and that classmate's mother were driving Dana home. And uh, when they uh, got to a street, Dana said for her to drop him off at the house that was actually across the street, from the Yule home, saying that's where his real father lived. The mother would recall that Dana would talk about seeing his real dad in Europe. And she once mentioned this to Glee. Quote, I mentioned that to Glee. We thought Dale was his stepfather at that point. She said, no, Dale is his father. Dana came up with different kinds of stories like that. I kind of thought at times he lived in a fantasy, not the real world. Dana also attended Edison Computech in Southwest Fresno, which was a, a magnet school for gifted youngsters. And so I'm not quite sure the time period that he went there, but he did go there. And Kathy Spent also went there with Dana. And she recalled that Dana was very driven, much like his father. Quote, I remember sitting and talking with him on the phone, and he would be writing letters to people and businesses he admired. He never said much about his parents, though. Quote, his mom was nice and his father was into business. And uh, because mommy and daddy supplied their little prince with an allowance every month, $800, and bought Dana a brand new Mercedes, Dana was elected uh, most likely to succeed of his high school class. Mm-hmm. And I can't remember if I mentioned this, but yeah, Dana and Tiffany uh, attended the, the same high school. By the way, that uh, brand new Mercedes that mommy and daddy got him, Dana ended up uh, wrecking it near the family's beach house in Pajaro Dunes. And get this. So not only did this little asshole wreck the car, Dale ended up taking the fall for him and acted like he was the one driving. No. Well, that is not doing your children any favors. You have to let them reap the repercussions of their actions so that, you know, when, especially when they're still kids and at home. So that way, right, you can like help them navigate that. But yeah, that, that was not Dana's uh, upbringing. Oh, and by the way, by the way, after that, Dale went out and bought Dana a brand new Mercedes again. Now, right, knowing all this, knowing, you know, how Dana was parented and whatnot, it's probably not too shocking that Dana had a pretty dark and twisted side to him. Shocker. And this showed in um, different correspondence that he wrote. Um, there was this one girl, I don't know if her name is Elke or, or, or Elk or Elke, E-L-K-E. I've literally never seen that name before. But uh, she was also um, an, an affluent uh, girl from a well-off family. And she went to school in Beverly Hills. And I'm not quite sure 
the relationship between her and Dana, if like they dated or whatnot, but Dana would end up writing her several letters. And uh, we're going to read a few of these letters just to really give you an insight into Dana's mind. So um, the, the first letter that uh, the book mentions starts off as, quote, How are you? I totally love girls. I mean it. Not that I was ever homo or anything. It's just that I do nothing in Switzerland but sit on this guy's yacht and look at girls in bathing suits through binoculars. Send me a beautiful picture. I'll pretend I'm Ozzy Osbourne and cut off your head with a chainsaw and then kiss you. Dana Yule. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In 1989, when he graduated San Joaquin, San Joaquin Memorial High School, he wrote another letter to her. And it was, quote, I wanted to write to you because I haven't heard from you in a long time. I can imagine your school year should be terrific. My junior year was the best yet. However, senior year is now becoming extra sweet. I got a new car. No, not a Porsche, but a much more reasonable my father extols to me. Mercedes 190E new. I'm going to put a phone in next week. They are rather convenient when you think about it. I'll be hosting a German exchange student via our high school. It will be a girl. Fun! Actually, all the German babes I saw in Germany were a little too hairy for my standards. Maybe I can Americanize her with my portable Norelco. I would love to go to Beverly Hills High like you. I can imagine the types of people. I think I would fit in well. I hope you are. Maybe we can catch a movie or something or a Lakers game. I have courtside seats via my mom's connections with LA-based attorneys. I had row seats last time to be precise. I really did think of you when I wrote this letter. Your life better be on the up and up or I'll come down there and spank you. Dana Yule. Mm-hmm. Let's continue, shall we? Another letter read, quote, Just something I picked up in Harold's England. It's very small and very expensive. Very you. You look so beautiful, you know. I have, oh shit, totally fallen in love with you. I love you. I promise I will come down to party your ass off within the next two months. I hope you like to party the rich way. Believe me, it's the only way to go. Oh God, I love you. Registration is tomorrow. Fuck, better be sober. We'll talk on the phone. Don't worry. I love you. So yeah, from that, I'm not sure if like they dated or what. Again, the book wasn't very like specific on who this girl was. But the last letter that Dana would ever write to her read, oh, and um, there is some racist terminology used. I, of course, I'm not going to use it, but just, yeah, be forewarned, the, the quote I'm about to show you does have that. So the last letter he wrote to her said, quote, I'm sure you didn't mean that all guys do not have feelings when you said that. I certainly do. Guess what? I am up to 1420 on my SAT now. I do not mean to brag, lie, or anything else derogatory. However, I have beaten all the dumb Asians in my school. You know, the Asians that everyone raves about. So, ha! When you think of the ideal affluent businessman, do you think of a short Japanese guy? I don't think so. Dana Yule. Yeah. Lovely. Right? Lovely. Now, after uh, Dana graduated high school in 1989, he then went to Santa Clara University. This was after he failed to get into his dream school, Stanford. And get this, Dana said he didn't get in because he was a victim of affirmative action. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Can you tell that I really hate this little shithead? I just want to punch his smarmy little face. Doesn't he have like an ugly, ugly punchable face? Now, at uh, SCU... Santa Clara University, uh, Dana majored in finance, wanting to be an investment baker. That sounded like baker. Banker. Banker. I did say banker, but it sounds like baker. He wanted to be an investment banker. So at uh, SCU, uh, Dana, of course, set himself up in the most prestigious, expensive dorm on the campus, Casa Italiana dorm. And uh, apparently this dorm had like, like apartment-like suites and stuff. And... Yeah, again, get this. Whereas, right, in college, most guys, they're going to put up like a poster of like, you know, a band, sports team, maybe some cars or a model or something. Dana put up posters of like businessmen that he admired. Apparently, one of those posters was a framed photo of convicted stock manipulator Michael Milken. Yeah, big, Big surprise that Dana would look up to some skis like that, right? Elizabeth Gulkasayan? I hope that's how you say her name. That was a mouthful. She went to uh, grade school with Dana. Uh, specifically, she went through kindergarten to eighth grade. So she didn't go to high school with Dana. But she also attended SCU and, you know, 
ran into Dana. And yeah, she described him as, yeah, she had always remembered him. Quote, he was very competitive in getting good grades. He is very smart and he knew how to carry himself very well. Another student and dorm resident of uh, Dana's was named Paul Gomez. And he would go on to describe his thoughts about Dana. Quote, this guy was smart. Very, very smart. You just didn't know what his limits were. The thing that was striking about this person was his sense of moral bankruptcy. I'm not just saying this in retrospect. Now, in the spring of 1990, as he's at SCU, my goodness, Dana would meet a fellow spoiled rich brat. Although, like, yeah, he didn't, this kid didn't come from, like, nearly the amount of wealth that Dana did. But he had still come from a really privileged, like, upper middle class upbringing. This spoiled brat's name was Joel Patrick Radovich. And he was originally from the San Fernando Valley um, here in Southern California. His father, Nick uh, Radovich, uh, had a PhD in engineering, and he mainly worked out of Atlanta, Georgia. And while he was mainly in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, Joel would uh, live with his mother in Southern California. His mother, Judy Radovich, was a piano teacher, and he also lived with his younger brother, Daniel. Joel's older brother, Peter, was uh, out of the house uh, at this time, was like grown adult. He was a plumber at Sketchley Mason Plumbing, and he was married to a woman named Daniel. Now, all in all, there were seven uh, Radovich children, and I know two of which were uh, twin girls who were like the neighborhood babysitters. But I don't have specifics like on their ages or anything. I think when uh, Joel is uh, attending SCU and meets Dana, I think it's just his younger brother, Daniel, and his mom at home, I think. Now, the Radoviches were described as a close, tight-knit religious family. I roll. And like we said, right, like with Dana, Joel was raised with a lot of privilege. He went to private prep schools and all that and enjoyed all the other advantages of being upper middle class was, right? Joel, along with his other siblings, attended a very, very prestigious high school. Chaminade High School? Is it Chaminade? Chaminade? But it was a very prestigious school. It was a private Catholic school. <sighs> cue another eye roll. And like I said, it was pretty prestigious. Like Bob Hope's children had gone there. Dick Van Dyke's grandchildren went there. There was like a signed photo of Dick Van Dyke hanging in like, I don't know, one of the, the halls or something. So yeah, like a, a pretty, pretty prestigious school. Joel would end up graduating from there in 1988. Now, neighbors who lived around the Radoviches and, you know, lived around them for quite some time described Joel as um, very quiet, very polite, very reliable, and some described him as handsome. I I don't think that really at all, but again, maybe I'm just letting the case cover my, you know, cloud my, uh, my perception. It said Joel really, really liked motorcycles, but he drove around in a black Honda Civic that everyone said he kept in immaculate condition. And he also drove like a bat out of hell. He... Again, typical rich, spoiled brat. He, like, would constantly drive 10, 20, 30 over the speed limit, run red lights, run stop signs, and all that. Now, while it seems Joel um, never really officially held a job, a neighbor said that he did do odd jobs here and there, um, including even selling steak knives. One childhood friend of Joel's said, quote, I never really saw him hang out with anybody. He spent a lot of time at home. Except that is when his father would come home. So his father, right, as we said, he mainly lived in Atlanta, Georgia, but he would, you know, come home occasionally. And apparently when he came home, that's when Joel would leave the house. Uh, the childhood friend said, quote, anytime he would come around, Joel would leave. I am not sure what the problem was, but he would always split. So that was Joel Radovich, this, this fellow spoiled brat who Dana met at SCU. And what is funny is that I guess they actually met in an, an ethics class. An ethics class where Joel plagiarized a paper. Paul, remember Paul Gomez? He described Joel. Quote, Joel was a character. He would ride around on a skateboard in the dorms. He would spit on the walls. He would grind on people. It was difficult to see what those two had in common. Another dormy, Piero Esola, Isola? liked Dana, but he didn't like Joel. Quote, Joel was shady. I stayed away from him. Now, while Dana is at SCU, oh my god, guys, what we're about to get into is just, 
mind-blowing. So while Dana's at school, he continues his his typical shtick, right? Flashing around his wealth and dressing in nice Armani suits and looking all prim and proper and whatnot, right? And just really, really living up to his trust fund baby image, right? However, however, get this, at SCU, Dana bragged about his father's success and like his successful business and stuff and like his successful investments and this farmland we own that's like super profitable. He would go on about that, right? But, but, so he would, he attributed all of the family's wealth and fortune to himself saying that he helped his father save his struggling business. Yeah, can you believe, I mean, I can believe it. Everything I know about this little shit, yeah, I can absolutely believe it. And, you know, remember, like, Dana had absolutely no business experience whatsoever. Neither he nor Tiffany had anything to do with, like, their father's business, with any of the investments or any of that. Oh, but don't you worry, it... It, it gets juicier. Dana boasted that he had traded stocks on the New York Stock Exchange in high school. He had held uh, prestigious internships at like really prestigious financial firms in Seattle and New York City. And, and he claimed to have formed his own business while still in high school named Yule and Company. Yeah, yeah. And of course, do I have to, I don't have to tell you, right? Like it was all Bullshit! It was all a fabrication. All a fabrication. There wasn't a single thing that Dana said that was correct or the truth. And so, right, just as he had been in high school, Dana was very, very popular. Not just because he, you know, flashed around the money and all that, but because he was like, you know, oh yeah, I'm like this, this business savant and I'm so successful and yada, yada, yada. So yeah, he became quite popular. In fact, he uh, became so popular and sort of infamous on the campus that the 1990 SCU yearbook did an article on Dana. And I am going to read it to y'all. Uh, obviously, I'll show it to you as I'm reading it, but it is just... Amazing. It is amazing. So let's get in to this complete BS article that the SCU 1990 yearbook put. So the title is Flying High on Wall Street. While most kids were spending their days skimming through comic books, Dana Yule was reading the Wall Street Journal. By the time he was a high school senior, the company he had formed had grossed over $2.7 million, making freshman Yule one of the youngest and most successful entrepreneurs anywhere in the United States. At age 18, he is a stockbroker, aircraft salesman, and the president of his own aircraft dealership, Yule and Company. Yule became fascinated with the stock market, and with the advice of his father, he started to invest. As his infatuation with the market grew, Yule took extensive courses in the sciences and in computers, and subsequently landed a summer job at a brokerage as an assistant technical analyst. After attending a Wall Street seminar in Washington, D.C. for high school students, and actually trading shares on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, Yule and nine other students from across the country started their own investment company. They guaranteed 1% above the interest rates the banks paid. This promise attracted many, and their business boomed. Their biggest customers were their peers, college and high school students. With the profits from the mutual funds they managed, Yule and Company bought out a bankrupt private aircraft company. The business has been so successful, Yule is thinking of starting a new dealership in San Jose, or perhaps even selling selling out to a bigger corporation. His company has continued to economically flourish, and people ask him why he decided to take time out of his busy career to attend Santa Clara. Yule answers, I need to get a well-rounded education. I can be here at SCU in the Silicon Valley and still be actively involved in the company. And the article was written by Alicia Lindsay. Yeah. Yeah. Can you... Can you believe this? This kid is cosplaying as his daddy. Like, and then I was reading, because like, as I was like, discovering all this and, and shit, I was reading some of it to Jeff. And he was like, did nobody at that stupid yearbook decide to like, check anything? And my, my thought process is like, I mean, why would they, right? This is a pretty prestigious private school. You know, most of the student population there came from pretty privileged upbringings, maybe not nearly as extravagant as Dana, but you know, up there. And with Dana, right, flaunting his dad's wealth, wearing the expensive suits, driving the expensive car, 
probably just didn't even cross their mind, right? After all, it's only like the dirty poor people that lie and scam, right? Yeah, I don't know. So after this yearbook article came out, right? Um, Dana started getting some attention from like very niche like magazines that focused on, you know, like, like business and career and stuff and local papers and stuff. And I have to have to read you guys these articles. It is bonkers. So uh, this article that I'm about to uh, read a snippet of came from a Career World magazine, and they were focusing on young entrepreneurs in this article. So the article is Dana Yule and Company. When Donald Trump spoke at the Wall Street Journal seminar, he probably did not realize that one of the participants would soon turn out to be a competitor. Dana Yule, then a high school student at San Joaquin Memorial High School in Fresno, California, was sitting in one of those seats. Noting the style and substance of the flamboyant entrepreneur he had read so much about. By the time Yule had graduated from high school, he was owner of a profitable aircraft distributorship and the proud owner of a Porsche 928 S4. He was also a sophisticated stock trader. Now a 20-year-old sophomore at Santa Clara University, Yule started Dana Yule and Company in 1987. While his primary income came from selling airplanes, a trade he learned from his father, he also diversified into transporting electronics in his own plane from the Silicon Valley to computer-hungry Los Angeles. With the money from these enterprises and extra cash pooled from other investors, he was able to sink a significant amount of money into stocks on Wall Street. The company's gross income topped $2.7 million in 1988 and $4.1 million in 1989. Yeah, yeah, the audacity of this bitch. Like, I think what really gets me is that, like, bitch, you had every advance and opportunity that anyone could get in this country. And, like, you're still a loser who has to take credit for for daddy's accomplishments. So, yeah, yeah, Dana was definitely enjoying his his time at college, right? However, in January of 1991, uh, Joel Radovich, remember Dana's little buddy, He and uh, two other students got in big trouble. They were charged with stealing $3,838 worth of uh, SCU furniture uh, from the dorm. Now, I'm not sure um, what, if any, legal repercussions happened to Joel and these two other students. I don't think Joel was expelled, though, because he would end up graduating SCU. Um, I know that uh, the school was reimbursed for the money. So, yeah, maybe mommy and daddy paid the school off and they were like, okay, we're not going to expel you. Not sure. So the next month in February of 1991, Dana requested that all of his college transcripts be sealed, which I didn't even know that you could do that. In the spring of that same year, 1991, Joel took like the maximum amount of credits that he could so that he could hurry up and graduate early. He was in a hurry to graduate. And it was during the same time that spring that uh, Dana would take Joel to meet the family for the first time and Joel would uh, go to the Yule home. And in June of that same year, just like with Dana, Joel also requested that his college records be sealed. The next month uh, in July, another article appeared about Dana and his, you know, successful business and entrepreneurial skills and all of that. And in November of this same year, 1991, this is when uh, Dana's bullshit starts to emit some uh, some stench, all right? So in November of 1991, uh, the local paper, the San Jose Mercury News, ran an article on Dana. The The newspapers said that they had uh, seen the, the yearbook article that SCU had done on Dana, and so they decided to contact him and run their own article on him. They described him like every other article, right? That, you know, he was a, a young success, had sold mutual funds, and, you know, was a was a millionaire by the time he was in high school, yada, yada, yada. This article, too, they specifically uh, said that Dana turned his father's failing airplane dealership into a success. The headline read, Teen Mogul Tries for Normal College Life. And the article's author, Shelby Grad, said that uh, Dana took him around San Jose, including uh, an air freight business that Dana claimed that he owned, but he wouldn't take uh, Shelby in there. And in the article, this fucking douchebag, uh, Dana was quoted as saying, quote, when I go into a class, I drop all of my money in companies and think of the teacher in Plato. Some people are obsessed with money. I'm more obsessed with achievement. 
the audacity of this bitch. Can you, like, are you all really absorbing everything I'm just, like, saying here? Isn't this wild? I've been so distracted, too, like, talking about this little bitch. I've been neglecting my makeup. Now, um, much, much later, right, when everything came out, uh, the, the article's author, he came out and, like, admitted, he's like, yeah, dude, he suckered me. And, yeah, he was like, yeah, I mean, I... Thought it was on the up and up. Like, not only did this kid, like, you know, have all the, you know, the the clothes and toys and stuff that, like, some rich asshole would have, but the school vouched for Dana, SCU. And so with that, you know, the San Jose Mercury um, News and Shelby here were like, oh, okay, we're good. Quote, he had a whole press packet. He showed me a lot of awards he had won, programs he had done. He had pictures of himself in front of airplanes. I guess he convinced me he was really in business and had some grasp of financial markets. The next month, in December of 1991, Joel finally graduated SCU, graduating early. He had graduated with a degree in finance, and he moved back to Southern California to live with his mother. The next month, January of 1992, Dana started seeing a girlfriend. It was a 19-year-old fellow SCU student named Monica Zent, and her father just happened to be an FBI agent, Agent John William Zent. So, right, things are going pretty well for little Dana, right? Like, not only does he get uh, to be a rich little bitch without earning anything, um, he managed for at least, you know, over a year to make everyone think that he had made all the money himself. Newspaper articles about him. He was popular. Everyone knew him. And now he uh, has a girlfriend, right? But, but... The uh, San Jose Mercury News, right? Rather, like, larger publication. I think it may have been, like, the largest publication that uh, Dana had done an interview with. And, as such, Dale and Glee saw it. Now, nobody, nobody knows what their reaction was, what, if any, actions they were planning to take were because they were very, very tight-lipped about it. A close confidant of Glee's um, said that when she asked Glee about it, because uh, it wasn't just Dale and Glee who saw this article, guys. Quite a few people in Fresno saw it. She uh, had asked Glee about it, and all Glee told her was, quote, Dale's taking care of it. Bob said that Dale was indeed aware of the article, but uh, he didn't talk about it. Bob had seen the article too, and he thought it was super, super bizarre. And maybe even ominous. Like, he thought it was so weird that Dana was, like, pretty much, like, pretending to be his father. Quote, The article is the key to this kid's mind. He actually believed he was this person his father wanted him to be. Maybe in a twisted way, it was just a young man crying out, Look at me, Dad. I'm successful. Love me. But after that article, he had to really become who he said he was. How do you step into a man's shoes unless you take him out of his shoes? So, yeah. Like I said, no one... No one knows what, if any, actions Dale and Glee took. There were rumors, nothing ever confirmed or substantiated. There were rumors that they were going to plan to cut Dana off. We don't know. There's Those are just rumors. But frankly, based on their past parenting, like, I'm not going to lie, dude, I would be shocked if they did do anything that drastic. But I don't know. Dale also had that uh, attitude, right? That, you know, he's a man. He should be able to take care of himself. So I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you think uh, Dale and Glee were planning on cutting Dana off? Or do you think they were going to try to, like, yeah, sweep it under the rug? So there's not a whole lot we know about that, right? But we do know that uh, on April 1st, uh, Dana helped his father prepare a financial statement on the computer. And so Dana got to see exactly the wealth that his father had built. And uh, yeah, so of course, right, it's going to show all of the family's, like, assets and wealth. They had $2.6 million in cash, $675,000 worth of stocks and bonds, $1.1 million in some sort of pension and like profit sharing fund, and their farmland was worth about $1.9 million. And this is in addition to like even, even more. Um, the grand, grand total when uh, Dana helped his father uh, make up the statement came to $7,974,500. Almost $8 million, right? And that is, that is our preamble 
for the events that we will discuss next. Yeah, pretty, pretty wild, right? So let's, let's get to the, um, events. That, uh, is the reason we're talking about this case. Uh, it is Easter weekend, 1992. Easter weekend, uh, the Yules spent some time in the Watsonville area. And here they visited, uh, friends and relatives, and this was near their beach house in Pajaro Dunes, uh, which is on the coast near Watsonville. And that was, um, that was, that, those were the, uh, the Easter plans for the Yules, right? Spending time at their beach house and hanging out with friends and family, right? So, uh, Glee and Tiffany drove down to the beach house while uh, Dale flew. He had a twin-engine Beechcraft uh, plane that uh, he flew, and it is said that uh, Dale never flew with his whole family on board because he was worried about wiping them all out. So he flew while Glee and Tiffany drove, and they all left Fresno on Friday, April 17th, 1992, to go and enjoy their Easter weekend. But uh, before Dale took off, he had had um, a heated, uh, heated exchange with someone. It was a client named Laws, and he had given his Aerostar plane um, to uh, Western Piper to repair. And uh, now he was like disputing the bill and not wanting to pay. So before he had taken off, uh, yeah, he had that heated exchange and yeah, like, like Laws was threatening legal action and all that. And yeah, it was, it was a pretty, pretty heated conversation. But, uh, as soon as Dale touched down in the Watsonville area, he was paged by work yet again. This time it was Bob. So, uh, not long before this, uh, Bob and Dale had sort of bickered over Bob's contract renewal. And, uh, Dale thought that they had, uh, come to, uh, a resolution. So he was like, why the hell is Bob paging me, um, about this? I thought we, you know, took care of it. And, uh, part of the agreement was to give Bob a raise in his commissions. However, um, Bob was upset because, uh, he hadn't noticed it when he signed the contract, but his, uh, retirement benefits were, like, grossly lessened because of this. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like, can you believe this cheap asshole? Like, come on, Dale. Like, this is your top salesman for, like, how long? Who's been with you for how long? And it's like, really? You can't, like, pay people what they're worth, you know? And they wonder what happened to company loyalty. What about employee loyalty? So uh, when Dale um, touched down and got on the phone with Bob, he told him, like, you know what? This is going to have to wait till Monday. I'm, I'm in vacation mode. I'm up here with my family. Um, Dana's going to bring his new girlfriend over. We've, we've just got a lot going on. We'll talk about this on Monday. So uh, the next day on Saturday in the evening on April 18th, 1992, the Yule, so Dana... Dale, Tiffany, and Glee, and uh, the Zents, which was Monica, uh, her father, Agent Zent, and her mother, all had dinner together at uh, the Yule's Beach House. Now, during dinner, Agent Zent uh, just kept going on about Dana and was telling, like, Dale and Glee, you must be so proud of all of his accomplishments. He mentioned how he had seen all the glowing articles about Dana. And yeah, it was just saying, like, oh, you must be so proud and whatnot. Um, it is said Dale just sort of, like, smiled grimly. Well, I guess, like, every Everyone else sort of like shifted uncomfortably in their seats. And uh, Tiffany managed to uh, bring up another topic that sort of diverted the conversation. Later during dinner, Monica mentioned that uh, Dana was super excited to take helicopter flying lessons. Though Dale was pretty like less enthusiastic talking about how expensive they were and how the upkeep of a helicopter was like a hassle and expensive. Yeah, Dale, it's almost as if you're a multimillionaire who could like afford that. Like, I just thought that was so funny. Like this guy is a multimillionaire and he's going to say helicopter lessons are expensive. What? After dinner, uh, the Yules and the Zents just uh, walked walked along the beach and yeah, just had a, a pretty pleasant evening. And uh, after they got back, uh, the Zents, uh, including Monica, so Monica and her parents, left for the Morgan Hill area, which was about 200 miles away in like the San, Fr San Francisco um, area. That's where they lived. Meanwhile, all of the Yules, including Dana, stayed behind. And uh, early the next morning, Dale and Dana had an early morning uh, tennis match. So they played tennis. And uh, after the match, Dana then left the area to drive to Morgan Hill. He was going to have Easter dinner at uh, the Zents. So they uh, finish their tennis game and Dana takes off, leaving uh, Dale, Glee, and Tiffany in uh, the Harrow Dunes, right? Meanwhile, during the same Sunday... April 19th, 1992, at the Yule home in Fresno, Joel rolled up to the house. 
He covered his car, got out his gym bag, and entered the family's home through the garage. After entering the code for the security alarm, which he knew, he laid out a plastic tarp over the floor in the uh, laundry room. He went into a guest room, ripped off all the uh, bed spreading and bed sheets uh, off of that, and laid it on the floor of uh, what was described as the girls' bathroom. And then he set to robbing the home of uh, anything that he saw of value, right? Uh, jewelry, CDs, coins, loose change, like whatever, whatever he could, right? And he laid it out on uh, these bed sheets. He then uh, went into Dana's bedroom, ripped off all of uh, his bed, bed sheets and bedspread, and he spread these ones on the floor of the family room. He found a couple of rifles and a shotgun, and he uh, laid these on uh, Dale and Glee's bed in their bedroom. He then set to work staging a robbery by, you know, pulling out all the drawers and tossing stuff willy-nilly and all that stuff. And he then went to the nightstand in uh, Dale and Glee's bedroom. And he retrieved that Browning 9mm uh, gun that Dale had purchased in 1971. He grabbed it. He also grabbed the two boxes of ammunition. They were exactly where Dana said they would be. Looking at the ammunition, uh, Joel thought it looked pretty old. Uh, because it was, it was like 20 years old. And he uh, pulled the Browning from its uh, its case and left the case behind. In the uh, process of retrieving one of the ammunition boxes, though, um, a live cartridge fell on the floor, but Joel did not notice it. So meanwhile, uh, back at the dunes, right? It's like early afternoon, late morning, early afternoon. And uh, Dale and Dana finished their tennis match. And uh, yeah, after they were done, Dana packed up his Mercedes and left for Morgan Hill to go to the Zents. Back in Fresno, Joel's pager went off. It was the signal from Dana that the plan was a go. So uh, a few minutes after Dana had left, uh, Dale packed up everything and prepared to uh, fly back home himself. His plane would uh, touch down in Fresno at 3.23 p.m. A few minutes after he had left the beach house for the airport, Glee and Tiffany left to head home. Remember, they drove. They uh, drove in Glee's Cadillac. And uh, they, they kind of took their time. It is said, um, especially after Tiffany's accident, Glee was a very, very cautious driver. And before they went home, they stopped at Foster's Freeze so Tiffany could get something to drink. Now, Glee and Tiffany arrived home first. And approximately 20 to 30 minutes or so-ish later, Dale arrived home. And as uh, each member of the Yule family entered their home, they were shot and gunned down and killed. Glee was shot four times while Dale and Tiffany had each been shot once. And the bodies of Dale Yule, who was only 59, Glee Yule, who was 57, and Tiffany Yule, who was only 24, wouldn't be found or discovered until Tuesday, April 21st, 1992. And they weren't uh, discovered till around 9 a.m., they uh, were discovered by the Yule's housekeeper. The The book and newspaper article said her name was Rosa uh, uh, Vita? Vita? Um, but uh, I saw her in a little, like, interview on an Oxygen series, and it said that her name was Juanita. So I, I'm not sure, but uh, she was the Yule's housekeeper. And uh, she alerted a neighbor, who then called 911. Paramedics and firefighters, right, entered the home, assessed the situation, and called in homicide detectives. Now, Rosa, or Juanita, would end up telling the police that Dana had phoned up a neighbor earlier that day, uh, concerned because he couldn't get a hold of his family and hadn't been able to get a hold of them for, like, over a day. And he wanted the neighbor to, to check on his family and see what was up. So... They secure this crime scene and call in the homicide detectives, right? Police would end up spending four days at the at the crime scene investigating, securing, collecting evidence, all that good stuff. The case uh, would be headed by Fresno County Sheriff's Office homicide detective John Souza. And he would be assisted by his partner, Detective Ernie Burke. And there would be a lot of other detectives uh, involved in this case, including Detective Mindy Ibarra and Detective Chris Curtis. Christian Chris Curtis. And Fresno County Sheriff Sergeant Dale Cottle would end up supervising all of the detectives assigned to the Yule case. Now, as Souza entered the home, he did have experience in um, like, like burglary and, and robbery cases. 
that's where he had uh, come from before homicide. And as he's looking through the house, he's noticing no for- no signs of forced entry. He's taking note of like, yeah, all the drawers that have clearly been pulled out and looked as if they've been rifled through and all that stuff. And his very first like knee jerk thought was wondering if like the, the killer or killers were looking for something or if they had just simply ransacked the place. They found the sheet in the bathroom um, that was laid out on the bathroom floor, and it had a bunch of, like, the loot that Joel just left behind. And beyond that was uh, Tiffany's body. She was uh, face down in the kitchen, lying in about a 30-inch thick pool of blood. Her uh, hands were pinned underneath her stomach, and her elbows were, like, out at, like, a right angle, and her toes were pointing uh, inward. She was wearing a blue sports shirt, jeans, white tennis shoes, and a black leather belt. Uh, There was a blue uh, cotton jacket and uh, the lining had like pink and teal flowers in it. And it was like right beneath Tiffany's uh, right shoulder excuse me, right shoulder. And uh, near Tiffany's body was a um, a yellow box of tissues and a uh, cassette tape. And the way that they were placed and stuff, it told them that she was clearly holding these items when she was shot. A Nob Hill grocery bag um, sat like almost like right above her right shoulder, which they assumed she'd probably place down when she walked in. Um, and then right, probably as soon as she sat down that grocery bag, she was shot. And upon surveying the scene and whatnot, Souza estimated that Tiffany was probably dead before she even hit the ground. And then they continued because, right, there were two more bodies that lay beyond Tiffany. Dale was found face down in the hallway. It was the hallway that was like directly off the kitchen. There was mail and four rolled up newspapers like scattered about. And they thought maybe he had like, you know, carried them into the house with him when he was shot. In between his ankles, which were crossed, was a pair of broken sunglasses. And there were um, fragments of what they assumed was the shattered uh, lens uh, near Dell's head. And of course, right, like they assumed that the bullet had obviously, you know, hit the sunglasses. Like with his daughter, Dale's hands were also pinned uh, underneath him with his elbows sticking out at a right angle. He was wearing a short sleeve tennis shirt jeans and tennis shoes. There was an obvious entry wound on the back of his neck and there was an exit wound in his cheek. And like with Tiffany, Dale too was shot once and they assumed that like his daughter, he was probably shot from behind and ambushed. Glee was found in the next room over. It was a smaller room. It was her office. Um, And the office was on the other side of the hall where Dale was. So yeah, the Yules were all kind of killed, like kind of in a, in a, tight area of the house, um, Glee's uh, feet were near Dale's head. Glee was found on her back uh, with her legs and feet canted to her left. Her uh, upper right arm covered most of her face and the back of her hand uh, rested on the floor. Um, And clutched in her hand were car keys, but of course they didn't know if she was coming or going. She wore a uh, Pajaro Dune sweatshirt jeans, and white tennis shoes. Now, the first thing, right, the homicide detectives, of course, had to do, right, was, like, preserve the crime scene, which was a little tricky in this case, right? Because even though you had this, like, sprawling, like, you know, mansion, this, like, huge house, the victims had all been killed in this, like, small little corner of it, right? So they had to really think about, like, how they were going to able to access the crime scene without disturbing any evidence. And an added complication was that, like, the hallway and the office where Dale and Glee were, like, were, were pretty narrow compared to the other um, rooms and hallways in the house. So, yeah, it was uh, it was definitely a concerted effort to try to, like, figure out, okay, how do we, like, enter the house? How do we assess this crime scene without disturbing anything? So they're outside discussing, right? And they notice there's a vehicle in the driveway. It was a Woody style a Jeep Wagoneer. And so they were like, you know what? Let's, um, let's peek in here. Maybe there's, you know, something in here. So there was a criminal technician named Jack Duty, and he uh, tried the door. Surprise, surprise, it was open. And on the visor is where he saw the garage door opener, like the clicker. So after they, you know, of course, dusted the, uh, the handle and the garage door opener and all that for prints, they then were able to access the house via the garage, which really helped a lot. And they then set to work on trying to recreate the killings, right? Because like, that's like the first thing I do, right? Is like, okay, what, like what exactly happened here, right? So the Yule's house faced south 
and it comprised of like three sections. There was the West Wing and that comprised of like a bedroom, a bathroom, a guest room. It was also uh, the, the wing that contained the master bedroom and bathroom. There was the main wing, which comprised of like the den, the kitchen, family room with the fireplace, the laundry room. And there was the East Wing, which was where Glee's office uh, and a bathroom were. There was uh, another bedroom and the uh, garage was on that side. So like these three big sections of this house. And so they decided to go through each each section methodically, right? So uh, they entered the West Wing first and the first door on the left uh, led to a bathroom, but uh, the entrance to that had been partially blocked by a stereo. And they saw that the stereo was laying on this pink bed sheet that was laid out on the floor. And there were also like cassette tapes, costume jewelry, and a camera there as well. The bathroom uh, led into Tiffany's bedroom and, you know, right? All of her dresser drawers and shelves were pulled out and there was, you know, like clothing scattered everywhere. Like it looked like the room had been ransacked, right? The lights were off, all the curtains were drawn, and the sliding glass door that led to outside that was in her bedroom was locked and secured as well. They then moved on to uh, the next bedroom, which was a guest room. And right, just like with Tiffany's room, it's clearly ransacked. And they saw that some of the sheets left on the bed matched the pink one that they saw in front of the bathroom. The master bedroom, of course, looked like the other bedrooms where, you know, stuff was just strewn everywhere, drawers and shelves were opened and things were just scattered everywhere. And then they, of course, saw the rifles and shotgun that Joel had left on the bed. Detective Souza uh, saw the nightstand where Joel had gotten the uh, browning and the two boxes of ammunition. And of course that was still open, right? So Souza went over there to uh, to check it out. And he saw that there were still uh, two boxes of uh, shotgun shells. There was a box of 357 Magnum loads. There was a box of uh, 22 cartridges. And there was an open box of Winchester nine millimeter cartridges. On the floor was the uh, leather hand case that the Browning originally went into. And there was an open box on the floor. And in the box was an owner's manual. Browning high power 9 millimeter Parabellum. And of course, there was no Browning to be found, right? But Sousa did find that 9 millimeter cartridge that Joel had dropped on the floor. He found it. So um, there were no other empty cartridges to be found. None at all. Just that one live cartridge that Sousa found. And that's when Sousa wondered if maybe like the killer or killers had taken the gun and cartridges when they were done. Next, they entered the kitchen and they saw on the table a uh, red and white ice chest and there was a purse on top, you know, as if like someone had been carrying it, place it on the table, obviously. A copy of the Fresno Bee was on the table. It was dated April 17th. And there was also a bank statement on the table of Dale and Glee's account, and it showed a recent $100,000 withdrawal. The laundry room, uh, which was adjacent to the kitchen, contained an exterior door to the outside. And when Sousa checked, uh, the deadbolt was locked in place and there was no other sign that like the lock or the door had been disturbed. Entering the family room in the den, once again, like with all the rest of the house, they saw stuff scattered everywhere, drawers open and stuff like that. And of course, they saw the pink and white striped sheet that Joel had laid on the floor. They then entered the East Wing and entered Dana's bedroom. He had uh, bank statements littered all over his floor. And they noticed that the fitted sheet on his bed, right, matched the one that was laying down in the family room. His bedroom light was on, but all of like the windows and, and locks and everything were secure and closed. And the very last room that detectives uh, swept through was the office where Glee had died. And they were able to access that through a shared bathroom off of Dana's bedroom. They saw a large desk and a sofa, and it was in between these where Glee's body lay. And peering into the closet, they saw a couple of filing cabinets, some fur coats, a copier, and a bullet hole. So uh, they then head back outside. And at that point, Dale's secretary, Marlene Reed, was on scene and talking to police. She was uh, questioned by Detective Souza. She informed him of what the, the Yule's Easter plans were and where they were. And she also informed him about the heated exchange that Dale and Laws had had before he flo flew off for the weekend. She also told Souza that Dana, the family's only son, had called her the previous evening, worried that he couldn't get a hold of his family. And uh, Sousa asked, like, wait a minute, like, why did you wait till t 
today on Tuesday to drive to the Yule home, you know, if Dana called you the night before. And Marlene said that she didn't because Dana was supposed to call her back and he didn't call her back until that morning. She said that Dana had told her that a neighbor had come by and saw that like Tiffany was injured. And uh, that's when she had headed to the crime scene. Um, Bob actually drove her. And uh, Susan was kind of irritated with her, which I'm not quite sure like what he wanted her to do, but like he was kind of irritated because right, like homicide case, every single second counts, right? And uh, he, he tried really hard not to be irritated with her uh, when he asked her, quote, Miss Reed, why didn't you get someone over here last night? And again, Marlene repeated that, well, Dana was supposed to call me back. And I wasn't supposed to do anything till Dana called me back. He didn't call me back till this morning. Detective Sousa, along with his partner, Detective Burke, then interviewed Bob. And he said that he last saw Dale on Friday afternoon. And he said that when Dale hadn't shown up to work on Monday, he was a little concerned. But when he was like also a no call, no show on Tuesday, like he knew something was wrong. He said that he uh, called the, the Yule home, but nobody of course answered. He said Dana had actually called Western Piper that morning and told him that there was trouble at the home. Quote, Dale seemed to have the perfect life. He made a ton of money and the family was awfully close. I don't understand. Bob also gave uh, Sousa and Burke uh, Dana's number along with uh, Dale's brother's num uh, numbers. Remember, uh, we have Dan, Ben, and Richard. Now, um, when Sousa was interviewing uh, Bob, I don't know, I guess he got like a weird feeling from him and he just made a mental note to like check into Bob further. Rosa or Juanita um, was also interviewed, of course. And yeah, she didn't really have much to offer. She was, she didn't know of any enemies the Yule family had. She, uh, she told them like, there's no large amounts of cash kept in the home. There was no history of like family drama or anything like that. And she also told them that the Yule's only son, Dana, was currently at Santa Clara University in San Jose. And she then explained how she had come upon the bodies. So she noticed, um, as she was like driving in that there was a pile of like newspapers at the, um, the uh, foundation of like the, the mailbox post. So she thought that was weird. And as she finished pulling in, pulling in and uh, was getting out of her car along with her two assistants, um, a man came and approached her and asked her like who she was and did she have a key to the house? This man turned out to be the neighbor that Dana had called. And uh, when she identified herself as the housekeeper, like, yeah, he was like, oh my God, so you have keys, right? And so they went and unlock the door. Now, uh, Rosa slash Juanita told the detectives that immediately upon like opening the door immediately, two things struck her as odd. One was that the alarm didn't buzz like it should have. And the second was the door to the kitchen that was uh, always, always opened was closed. She said that uh, she could see into Tiffany's bedroom and she could see that it was like all in disarray and it was a huge mess. And that is, as she was looking at Tiffany's bedroom, the neighbor opened that door into the kitchen, and that's when he was met with Tiffany's body. He immediately, like, closed it and, like, ushered um, Rosa slash Juanita and her assistants out of the house. He was like, no, 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 we gotta go, we gotta go. He's like, he freaked out, dashed to his house, and called 911. I mean, I would too, like, oh my god, I, god, I would never, never, ever want to find a dead body. That sounds awful. And uh, the neighbor was also the one who had carried all of the newspapers into the house. And I think that's why he had, like, I think when he saw Tiffany's body, because like, you know, he had carried those newspapers in, I think like he just dropped them. So that's where they had come from. Another person Detective Souza talked with was Sean Shelby. Remember Dana's uh, friend from junior high and high school. He told Souza that Dana was, quote, the most materialistic person I ever met. And he was the one who actually suggested to Souza that, like, Dana made a, may have had a hand in this. And he added that uh, one time Dana had asked him to burglarize his home. Quote, Dana likes being called a crook. He's the most materialistic kid I ever met. Everything had a price tag, you know? He would always tell you how much his clothes cost. So after uh, wrapping up those initial interviews, they went back inside. And, you know, again, going through it, they could find no signs of forced entry anywhere. The circuit breakers outside the home were fine. They were turned on. They weren't cut or damaged or anything. And uh, in the yard area, they did find some like flattened weeds that looked like someone may have like stomped through them. And uh, these weeds were near the uh, metal storage shed. And uh, there was like a wooden fence, I think, like behind the shed as well. So like they were thinking like, oh, 
maybe someone like hopped the fence. Inside the home, um, yeah, in addition to like checking doors and deadbolts and all that stuff, they checked all the skylights. They were all secured and locked and all that. And there were no other signs of forced entry, no broken glass, no tool marks anywhere or anything. And Souza was like thinking his head, like, okay, the alarm was turned off. But was that turned off, like, yeah, like by the maid? Did the Yules forget to set it before they left? And with all with all of this going on in his head, right, Susan was thinking that this, this wasn't really like a burglary gone wrong or anything like that. And uh, while they were outside kind of conferring with each other, Sousa uh, mentioned what he was thinking. Quote, I think a lot of the stuff piled on the sheet is just crap. No value to speak of. I mean, cassette tapes when the real valuables were mostly untouched. And we all know a pro is going to make his haul with pillowcases, not sheets. What is the deal with the sheets? And he thought at first, like, well, maybe this was done, done by like some stupid kid. Quote, but good Lord, what kind of kid handles a multiple homicide with that much style. And yeah, he wasn't sure what to think. All he knew was that this was clearly not a robbery gone wrong or anything. Quote, something's out of whack. We need to know if they were all shot at the same time. And so that was the next thing they did, right? So inside, technicians set to work analyzing, right? Like the bullet trajectories and, and all that good jazz, right? So they found a small nick in the ceiling um, where the ceiling uh, dropped off to uh, accommodate a heating duct. And this was right uh, above uh, Dale's body. And then there was another nick from a bullet in the sheetrock at the end of the hall. And from the angle, they could tell that the bullet had come from an upward trajectory, meaning that like most likely the shooter had like crouched and, you know, shot at Dale from that angle. So the one round, right, that killed Dale, it had gone through Dale. Remember we talked about he had an, in uh, he had an entrance and an exit wound. It bounced off the ceiling, hit the sheetrock, but it didn't penetrate it. However, they found, they found no bullet. There was nothing there and they were like, dude, did the like the the killer or killers like take it with them? Tiffany, like we said, right, like her father was killed by a single shot. They found a bullet hole uh, high on the kitchen wall, and that is where the bullet had embedded itself after passing through Tiffany. And of course, they they were able to recover it. And uh, the next part's gonna be. <sighs> A little graphic. Um, so when they set to work trying to analyze Tiffany's body, uh, they actually had trouble um, flipping her body over because remember, she was in a thick, thick pool of blood for days, right? And she was essentially glued to the floor. One examiner had to actually jam his hand inside her belt loop and like yank her from where she lay. And underneath her body, there was still some blood that was still damp. It wasn't like dried or congealed. There was also a flattened uh, plastic cup that was uh, stuck to the tile um, where it had been crushed by Tiffany when she fell to the floor. Guessing it was probably the Foster Feet Freeze's uh, drink. They uh, cleared hair from her, her forehead and her face and they could see the buttonhole shaped exit wound um, in her forehead. And uh, with a lot of difficulty, again, moving her hair and kind of examining uh, her scalp, they managed to find the entrance wound. And that had been like, yeah, right in the back of her skull. And then they moved on to Glee's body. So um, with Glee's body, right, it was very clear that she had more than, than one shot. And due to that, and due to the other forensics that they would do, they theorized that Glee more than likely had confronted her killer, had possibly seen her daughter killed in front of her, and had tried to run. And remember, this was not like Dale or Tiffany, who they were theorizing never saw what hit them, never, never even realized they were, they were hit and, and dead, you know? But Glee she knew. They found an entry wound on Glee's right upper arm, and there was another wound that was um, apparently made by that same bullet. They found another bullet wound when her shirt was lifted, but they couldn't tell if it was an entrance or exit wound. Uh, I guess uh, Glee wore a prosthetic left breast, and they could see that the top of it had been creased by the bullet. And uh, there was another hole in her chest that was clearly visible, and it was right above the prosthetic. There was also a very um, noticeable entry wound on her left cheek. And when they turned uh, Glee's body to the side, um, a bloody chunk of something came to the floor. It was the bullet. When they pulled up the uh, back 
of her sweatshirt, there were two more uh, bullet wounds and evidence of lividity on the skin. And um, upon examining her, her head, like her scalp and her hair, they found an exit wound at the back of her skull. And uh, all in all, they determined that Glee had been shot four times. And when they would uh, later autopsy her body, they would find another bullet. Additionally, Another bullet would be found when they uh, cut away the square of carpet where Glee's body um, lay dead. And uh, the bullet was like, was like flattened. Now, uh, examining the, the bullet trajectories in Glee's office, um, they could tell that there were, were two clear bullet trajectories. So one um, was clearly visible. It was a few feet off the floor. It was in the blue and white striped wallpaper right near the closet. And right, like there was a very obvious clear gaping hole of where the, the bullet had, had hit it. And when they cut that wall away in the hopes of finding the bullet, not only did they find uh, the bullet, it had lodged itself into a stud, you know, a two by four. The bullet was like in such immaculate condition like, it could have been reloaded and refired. Yeah. By the way, this was after the bullet had passed through Glee's body, the wallboard, and like, and then into the two by four. So that's pretty amazing that it would still be in that pristine of condition. The other bullet had passed through the door itself, had puncture a paper bag of clothes that was on top of the filing cabinet, and it had exited the back of the closet. Remember, the filing cabinet was inside the closet. And so uh, following the path, they actually were led outside. And uh, there, they found, following like the bullet's trajectory, they found a large hole in the stucco wall um, on the outside of the house. And in the flower bed, like right below that, they found another bullet. Now, all in all, they would manage to recover six bullets, but they never recovered the bullet that had killed Dale. But... Another thing. So even though they found those bullets, another thing they noticed was that like there were no empty cartridge casings anywhere. And they were thought they thought like, well, if the killer used a revolver, the, the empties wouldn't be ejected. Right. But if an automatic weapon was used, then, you know, they would be. And so someone, presumably the killer or killers, had cleaned them up. So that was already really weird, right? And so the next thing they had to determine is in what order the family had died. And based on, right, like the positions of the bodies, what they knew about the family's movements that day and what whatnot, that's when they came up with the theory that it was probably Tiffany killed first, Glee second, Dale came home, was the last one home, came home later, and was the last one killed. Even though Dale's body was much more decomposed um, than Tiffany and Glee's, they wondered if it was just because the hallway where he was um, was much, much warmer compared to the kitchen in the office. So going back into the house, uh, Detective Souza found criminalist Alan Boudreau in the master bedroom, and he was examining uh, the, the box of 9mm cartridges that they had found. And when asked if he thought those had been the, the type of bullets used to kill the family, uh, Boudreau just answered, quote, can't be sure until we get back to the lab, but I wouldn't be very surprised. Now, publicly, all right, the police initially said very, very little. They disclosed that they did believe the victims to be that of the Yule family, that Dana was at that moment on a route back to Fresno to talk to them, that the bodies had been discovered in different rooms in the house, and that at that moment, no, they had no suspects. Quote, I am not at liberty to discuss the case because it could hinder the investigation. The investigation is wide open. We have not been able to narrow it down. And this was according to Fresno County Sheriff Steve Majerian or Bagarian, not sure. And citing that they had a lot of evidence to process and go through. Because like I said, this case was huge, all right? And like almost as soon as cops were alerted to the Yule home, came the press and the media. Because again, right, it's a rich, prominent family, right? And yeah, so they were already having to deal with reporters and press, like, as they had just gotten on scene. Detective Burke added, quote, it was quick and it was clean. So uh, from behind bars, Frank, remember Frank, he commented that uh, it could have been to uh, Dale's ruthless business tactics that... Um, this had happened. Quote, my theory, and it's just a theory, is that he stepped on somebody and he didn't care whom he stepped on. Meanwhile, at that very moment, right, D uh, Dana was on his way back to Fresno. He had actually called uh, Monica's father, Agent Zent, a little past nine in that in the morning uh, in a panic, telling him that like someone was injured at his house. Agent Zent uh, then phoned up a fellow agent who was stationed in Fresno, who in turn then contacted, right, the, the Fres Fresno Sheriff's Office. 
and that's when they learned about the three bodies at the Yule address. Agent Zent then chartered a private plane and flew himself, Dana, and Monica down to Fresno. And the three of them arrived at the Fresno police station just as Detective Souza and Burke got back to the station. Uh, the detectives first sat and talked with uh, Agent Zent. He recapped, you know, the previous weekend, having dinner with the Yules, walking on the beach, how, you know, Everything was normal, nothing was amiss, no one was fighting, everyone was in good spirits. And he told them how Dana had come to him that morning. Quote, he had been worried about his family since he had been unable to contact them since Sunday. And when he called the airplane dealership, the secretary said the Bonanza had returned to Fresno, but Dale hadn't been seen since. A neighbor went and checked for Dana and said he saw someone down in the Yule residence. The description ma matched that of Tiffany Yule. And then they asked him like, okay, so it was after that that uh, Dana called you? Quote, Indeed. He was scared. And yes, he called me. I told him to stay put and I hired a plane to bring us right down here. I'd learned through your office that his family were probably the victims. So I prepared him to speak to Lieutenant White. And uh, it was very apparent to Sousa and Burke that like Agent Zant was clearly a huge fan of Dana and fought a lot of him. And uh, yeah, according to Zant, yeah, it was clear he hadn't picked up on like anything weird about him or anything, right? So that, that's what uh, the detectives are thinking as they're, as they're speaking with him. And then they asked him how Dana had been processing everything. Quote, he was extremely nervous. Dana is uh, an extremely meticulous person and he was very nervous. That's why I said I'd handle things, could do some liaison between law enforcement. And before his interview concluded, he added, quote, I think only that when I told Dana at the airport, Dana seemed very shocked in disbelief. And when Lieutenant White confirmed it, he seemed to be going into shock. You could tell from the facial appearance, color features, the nervousness, the shaking. Monica was interviewed next. And uh, her story stayed uh, consistent as far as like times and dates and all that to uh, establish Dana's alibi. He was having Easter dinner with the Zents. And when asked if he had any trouble with his family, Monica answered, quote, no, I mean, no, he had a disagreement agreement over what to do during the summer or something, but no big deal. Dana's a finance major and he's taking over 25 units and he does really good. I thought he and his parents got along great to tell you the truth. The next interview they did was with uh, one of Dale's brothers, uh, Dan. He had been called at about 11 that morning and informed of the news and had come straight down. And his interview didn't really have much to offer. Just family was close. Dale and Dana had a close relationship. Nothing suspicious or weird going on. He was aware that Dale's business was very profitable and he didn't know of any boyfriends that Tiffany had. And when asked if his brother had any problems maybe in his professional or personal life, Dan said, quote, not that I'm aware of, but something you should follow up on, um, Marlene Reed said he received a disturbing fax on Friday afternoon, which she left on his desk for him to see when he came back Sunday. Something about an angry attorney. And then it was Dana's turn. And get this, get this. As like, uh, Burke and Souza were leading Dana into the, the interview room, Agent Zent like walked in as if he was gonna like go in with them. And they like told him, they're like, nah, bro, we got this. You can can wait outside. So uh, Dana recapped his weekend and went into great detail about how he had been trying to contact his family since that Easter Sunday. Quote, see, in our family, I call every weekend on Sunday. We try to make it about six o'clock, have a chat. I used to write letters and stuff. Let's see, your question was, oh yeah, I let it ring and ring. And I called again and let it ring and ring and ring. And I thought, that's odd. Thought maybe they took a walk and forgot to set the answering machine. So anyway, I just went to bed and tried again the next day, and I noticed there was a click in the line when I called. It didn't sound right. I wondered if they put the call forwarding on? Anyway, I wondered what the deal is, but it was the middle of the day, so... And he went on about, like, five minutes on how he had tried different lines at the house, uh, business lines, lines at the beach house and all that, and he still couldn't get a hold of anybody. And when uh, he couldn't get a hold of anybody after a couple of days, he had called his grandmother and Marlene. Dana said that he hadn't heard of any business problems that his father was having, other than, you know, like, usual lawsuits and stuff, saying that his father hated lawyers. He also went out of his way to say that his parents were religious about setting that alarm. And Burke and Sousa then asked Dana if he knew that his father had any enemies. And he said, quote, well, I can't think of any enemies. He's just a real nice, able guy. But the guy dad bought the company from, Frank Lambeccio, he's like the biggest criminal in the world. And you know, he went to prison once for drug smuggling, but he said he knew of no one that had been involved in Western Piper that was dealing with drug smuggling or, you know, anything like that. And he also wasn't aware of anyone being arrested using his father's plane or business for drug smuggling. Quote, not that I know of, it was the first thing that came to mind when they say when they said three dead bodies in the house, but dad stayed away from those types, guys from Florida and all. I don't know what he meant by that. He again knew of no boyfriend 
boyfriends that uh, his sister had, and said that uh, he knew no one who would hate his family enough to kill them. And then Detective Burke asked Dana if he had made any enemies. Quote, nah, mind if you go back to high school. He said he never really had any problems with kids at high school, at least not problems that would have escalated to them, you know, getting revenge by killing his family. And then they asked about, well, what about like people or kids like in your neighborhood or something? Dana answered, quote, there's a real history of troubled people on my block. It wasn't long ago my family were talking and said, gee, you know, it seems like all the people on our block are just quacks. I mean, the kids have turned out to be monsters. Burke then shifted the conversation to the alarm system. And uh, Dana told them that they had uh, got an alarm system. It was a like top of the line alarm system about five years prior after a robbery or excuse me, a burglary. And uh, throughout his whole interview, Souza thought that Dana was very unemotional. He had even laughed during some of his answers. And Souza couldn't like, he was trying to like, he's like, is this kid just in shock? Or like, does he just not know how to express himself emotionally? Like, what's up with this kid? Quote, the kid has lost his whole family. If I focus on him and I'm wrong, I'd compound the tragedy beyond measure. Maybe the kid just can't show emotion. He's probably just got an odd way. That doesn't mean a damn thing. And they concluded their interview with Dana, and the police continued with their investigation. One neighbor interviewed, uh, Carol Bagley, said that she saw either a white or light blue two-door van parked in front of the Yule's home either Sunday or Monday. And as Souza was re-examining uh, the crime scene, he got an urgent call from Bob, who said that he needed to talk to detectives immediately. So when uh, Burke and Souza went down to talk to Bob, he said that uh, he was concerned about Western Piper shop foreman Jack Whitman. He said uh, Jack was an abusive alcoholic and that uh, Dale and Jack had actually argued that past Friday because uh, Jack was called in on his day off. And uh, Bob said he wasn't too certain what else uh, that argument between them was about, but he thought it had to do with that uh, Aerostar repair bill. Whose owner, by the way? was an attorney. But uh, Bob said what was really incriminating to him is when uh, he, Marlene, and Jack and everyone at the company were talking about it. And Jack had told Marlene that the family had been killed as they were coming home. He said that Jack did have access to the business on the weekends, and it wasn't all that unusual for him to be there on Sundays when Dale would have returned home, right? Quote, talk to Marlene. I don't like to point fingers, but I believe Jack Whitman is quite capable of killing someone, especially the way he and Dale have been arguing over the last few years. And uh, on their way uh, back to the office, um, Sousa wasn't really really buying anything that, that Bob said, but uh, he certainly had his eye on Bob. Quote, for somebody who doesn't like to point fingers, Purcell sure has a talent for it. And he was wondering, yeah, if Bob was trying to like put distraction away from himself. Now, the day after the bodies were discovered, right, all of the detectives met up to discuss, right, like, what, what they were thinking. What were their initial impressions based on what they had found out so far? And Sousa started with, quote, Guy didn't know squat about robbing a house. Open the drawers from top to bottom. Well, most of them anyway. Sometimes I think two people were there, but then I waffle. Whatever. Most of the valuables were left behind, apparently. I don't know. Why didn't the alarm go off if someone got in there? Okay, maybe the alarm wasn't set, but the kid Dana said it always was. Why weren't there any signs of forced entry? We all wondered if the crook waited and followed the victims in. But from the way they were shot, I just don't think that happened. Detective uh, Curtis added, quote, it would appear that the shooter killed the women and then waited around to kill the guy. Why? Why didn't he just get the hell out of there? So either Dale was the target or they all were. Boudreaux, who would be the one to actually like um, really look at like the bullets and stuff like that and, and the determine the murder weapon used, uh, commented, quote, We have no empty brass, and from the bullet I got a look at yesterday, a 9 millimeter, it wasn't a revolver, which then means there were ejected casings. And then that's when Sousa asked, You've got to ask yourself, why bother to police up the brass? So um, another thing that was really, you know, puzzling to them was that, like, they agreed that, like, the signs of a, of a, of a burglary, robbery, whatever... It was almost as if, like, a kid did it. Like, if you had asked a kid, like a teenager, like, oh, go make it look like you ransacked this house and you were going to rob it. Like, that's what it looked like. However, the killings, specifically of uh, Dale and Tiffany, were like, there's no fucking way a kid could do this. Detective Ibarra said that she was worried that this may have been a hit job. Quote, I'm concerned with what we don't have. No witnesses, apparently no prints, no murder weapon. Was it a hit? If someone hired a hitman and we can't get the shooter in here and talking, we may never have anything. Never, ever. And then that got them talking, right? Like, okay, well, if it was a hit, what 
What would be the motivation? Greed? Would it be revenge? And that's when uh, Souza piped in with, quote, But this kid, Dana, maybe he was in shock or something, but I've seen a lot of surviving family members, too damn many, and his reactions were like any I've ever witnessed. We can't count him out yet, but it looks like he was having dinner with a goddamn FBI agent when the family was killed. So, you know, kind of going like, well, yeah, it's going to be hard to tear apart his alibi. You know, he's with a freaking FBI agent. Lieutenant Richard White, who was uh, heading the meeting, said that... At first, they should look more into um, Dale and his businesses, um, business practices, clients, like anyone that he had business with and like you know, go go that route first. And like, yeah, try to see if like there was anyone who would want Dale dead. Quote, then if we find no one else, we can see what makes us Dana tick. And the police, they had to be really careful with this case, right? Like, I, I told you guys that like the press were like, at the crime scene, like, mere hours after the bodies were discovered, right? This was a prominent, well-known family. Um, they were, you know, they were rich and whatnot. And they had a lot of connections. And so the pressure was on the sheriff's office to, like, not just close this case, but close it quickly. I guess, like, the, the sheriff of Fresno had already said that he was going to keep a, like, close personal eye on the investigation. And uh, Sousa said that this was sort of like a, a double-edged sword, right? It's just not a day without dog or cat hair in the falsies. So, yeah. Sousa was like, okay, this is kind of like a double-edged sword, right? So, like, we have all these eyes on us. The sheriff is watching us. However... That also means, right, like, we're going to have more resources to deal with because they're going to want us to solve this case quickly. So I mentioned earlier, right, uh, Boudreaux would be the one who examined, like, the bullets, and, and th that was his area of expertise in this case. And so as such, right, he uh, was examining the six bullets they recovered. And uh, after examining the bullets that were found at the crime scene, he talked to detectives Sousa and Burke. Quote, you guys are going to think I'm out of my tree. There are strange striations, scratches on the slugs. The bearing surfaces are all hacked up. And this is when we're going to get a little bit into uh, some like ballistics. Um, learned, learned a little bit with this case. So while examining the bullets, uh, Boudreaux noticed two things. First, he noticed the rifling characteristics on the projectiles. And uh, rifling characteristics refer to the marks um, left on the bullets by a series of landing grooves that are machined into the gun barrel at the time of manufacture. So uh, apparently, after the uh, gun barrel is hollowed out in the manufacturing process, a special tool is then like pulled through it. And that's what leaves these, these characteristics in, in the gun barrel. And the grooves I guess, are either twisted left or right. And they, I guess, impart spin on the bullet when it's ejected. And apparently this helps, like, stabilize it in flight and allows it to, like, fly straight. The The book used the analogy of it. It's like putting a spiral on a, on a football throw. So that's what uh, rifling characteristics are, right? So when uh, Boudreau was looking at the rifling characteristics of these bullets they recovered, he saw that it appeared that the barrel of the uh, murder weapon used was manufactured as a six right, which means the barrel had six lands and grooves with a right hand twist, which I guess is apparently like, I guess was apparently quite common. But I guess what uh, what made this strange was a series of strange scratches that were also prevalent on the bullets. They're called Corstria, and uh, these scratches covered the uh, land and groove markings on the bullets. And this was the second thing that he had noted. Like, that's kind of weird. Where did these scratches come from? Like, that that's odd. He had never seen anything like that before, and he noted in his report, quote, I believe these strio were present on the bullets because the murder weapon was equipped with a silencer, flash suppressor, muzzle brake, or some other device or barrel attachment. Later, Sergeant Cardell told me that neighbors reported hearing unusual noises that were not perceived as gunshots. A total of six bullets were recovered. A total of seven shots were accounted for at the scene. Given that one fired bullet and seven expended cases were missing, it was apparent that the murderer or murderers had picked up these items, a rare event even within all the accumulated experience of investigators present. 
Boudreaux had told uh, Burke and Sousa, quote, that clanking sound, uh, Christian, that's De- uh, Detective Curtis, said the neighbors heard. A silencer would sure as hell explain it. People think a suppressor silences a weapon, but more accurately, it changes the way the report sounds, right? And it was like after uh, Boudreaux had uh, said this, that they were wondering, like, shit, are we dealing with a contract killer? And not just a contract killer, like one who went through the effort to clean up up all of the shell casings and stuff, right? Or cartridges, whatever. And, right, like, the the way especially Dale and Tiffany had been so, like, efficiently killed with, like, one shot, right? Like, it it was a real head scratcher. And the only thing they, they knew for certain at this point in time was that, like, yeah, no, the Yules were not killed in a botched robbery. Or excuse me, burglary. After going to lunch, uh, Susan Burke returned to the crime scene. Um, they were going to go with uh, Dana, and he was going to do a controlled walkthrough. Pretty much identify anything in the house that was, like, misplaced, anything else that was missing, that kind of stuff. Dana was accompanied by his uncle Richard and Agent Zent. And apparently uh, Agent Zent had actually went back to his Morgan Hill home and dug through the trash to get uh, receipts of like some Easter cards that Dana had bought um, that Easter Sunday after he left his father at Dana's request. So uh, as they walk through, uh, Dana confirmed that his uh, father's Browning 9mm was missing and that it did belong in that case, in that drawer. And as they moved uh, to the place where like Dale actually died, because they obviously had removed the bodies at that time, Susan kept a really close eye on Dana. And he wanted to see if he had any kind of reaction standing where his father died, where his body had been. But uh, Dana never showed any emotion. He was very, very cold. And he just didn't seem to, like, yeah, care that, yeah, he was, like, walking right where, like, his family's, like, bodies lay, right? And it was just, it was all very odd to Sousa. And Dana's weird behavior continued when they got to Glee's office, right? So they obviously didn't step, like, inside office, right? Don't want to contaminate. Still an active crime scene. But uh, when they got to the office where his mom died, all Dana said was, quote, I need to get the files. Referring to the the file cabinets in the the closet. And yeah, like, I mean, Sousa already thought that was weird. He's like, wait, like, that's, that's what's on your mind right now? And Sousa was like, well, sorry, you can't. You can't enter there. This is an active crime scene. And Dana looked to Agent Zent as if, like, he could do anything. And he just, you know, shrugged like, what do you want me to do? And then Dana whined, quote, can't you at least check the answering machine? Because there was a phone in the office. And uh, B- Burke said like, well, we can't see the buttons. It's dark in there. And that's when Dana snapped and was like, well, turn on the lights. And that's when they informed him like, well, you know, when the technicians were uh, cutting into the wall to retrieve uh, that bullet, remember that bullet that was found in the stud? They accidentally hit some wires. So there's no electricity to this room right now. And I guess dang Dana like angrily like nodded his fist to his side like the spoiled rotten child he is. And uh, then just demanded, quote, is someone going to pay for this? And at this point, Sousa said he was really, 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 really trying hard to not suspect Dana. Sorry, I was getting a headache with that headband, so I had to throw my hair up. So yeah, Sousa was already trying to like mentally talk himself out of suspecting Dana. And like Sousa was trying to rationalize himself, right? He was like, surely if this kid killed his family, had his family killed, like surely he'd be smart enough to start like acting like a human, right? And I guess they told him, well, like, there's a form you could fill out. And Dana was just like waved his hands, like, just forget it. They did uh, play the answering machine. Dana even rewinding it. But there was like, no, there's no messages. And I guess Dana just like shook his head in frustration. And once they're outside, Dana noticed a bunch of like technicians like taking things out of the house. And that's when, you know, he demanded, quote, where are they going with all that? Sousa just responded, it's dishes, things like that. They'll take it down to the lab to gas for fingerprints. And Dana said, quote, well, I want an itemized list of items taken from my house. They all then went back down to the station and uh, Burke and Sousa then interviewed Richard. And remember, that's Dana's uncle, Dale's brother. Uh, he said, yeah, he and Dale talked quite often, mostly about family. And no, he didn't have a key to the house. He didn't know the security code to the alarm. And uh, when asked to describe Dale's relationship with his immediate family, 
Richard said, quote, It was a beautiful family. If I were asked to give an example of a model family, it would certainly be that family. As a matter of fact, as recently as a few months ago, I told Dale it was strange he was the only one of the brothers who ended up with a real nice family that stayed together. That's, that's just what makes this more tragic. I don't know how Dane is holding up under this. His dad was so proud of him. Dana really loved his father because they did a lot together. Of course, Tiffany is the same way. He went on that there were never any major problems, maybe like normal family squabbles and whatnot, but nothing major. He had never heard of any drug use on either Dana or Tiffany's part. They then asked Richard if he knew anything about his brother being involved in drug smuggling. Remember, Lieutenant White wanted them to dig into Dale's like professional life and, and eliminate that as you know, a motive for the murder. And Richard was like, hell no, absolutely not. Like he was on the straight and narrow. He like hated that shit. Like, no, there's no way he wasn't ever involved in that. At least not that I ever heard. And in fact, he added that like, I haven't even heard of like my brother being involved in drug smuggling until his death. And he could offer like no possible motive, just saying that like this whole thing didn't make sense. And to that, the detectives agreed. And after Richard, detectives then interviewed Dana for a second time. They asked him to recap his day going back to Sunday. Quote, oh, from the beginning? Okay, dad and I played tennis at 10 in the morning. Then we came back and took showers, ate lunch. Then we did Easter presents and went for a walk on the beach at about 1230. I had to get to Monica's by three. So we packed up and started to close up the house. I think I took off at about 2.15, and then I stopped for gas, cleaned the windshield. When I was driving to Monica's, I said, oh, I better get some Easter cards. I bought cards, three of them, at the Payless. He went to Monica's, they had dinner, and then uh, her parents came over. Sousa asked him what food he had. Quote, uh, chicken, some breaded chicken thing, and zucchini she heated up. I guess her parents came about six, and we played with Monica's sister. She's like 10, old maid and stuff. I guess he was like snickering and laughing as he was like saying all this, like it was just like a normal conversation. And uh, when Burke asked uh, what time Dana had left the Zents, I guess all of a sudden like his demeanor changed and he was back to like sitting upright and being serious and said that, and said, quote, nine after nine. They asked Dana if his father had anything to do with Brighton Crest development. Remember that failed development deal that him and Ben were involved with? And like they had like the Filipino investors. And Dana said he didn't, quote, because we were hearing there was a policy on your dad with the money going to the corporation of theirs. And Dana smiled and said that was a, quote, wonderful fabrication. And Burke told them, like, hey, people are calling us with, like, this information. And Dana just said, quote, that's wild. They then asked Dana, who or what is the Yule Company? And Dana responded with, quote, that's, that's the license plate on my car. That's just the license plate I started. And Burke then asked him, like, how do you start a license plate? And that's when Dana corrected himself. Quote, I mean created. When asked about uh, his family's financials, Dana said the last that he looked, his family's wealth was about $7 million. And that's when Sousa asked him, quote, Dana, is there anyone you know, other than the obvious person yourself, who would gain by their death? And apparently Dana took his time answering this question. Quote, I don't know how the corporation works, but Bob Purcell over at Western Piper, I guess he might become president now. He wanted to sue everyone who touches him, and he's lied to my dad in the past. Otherwise, I don't know. And when asked if his father had problems with anyone else at his business, Dana chuckled as he said, quote, most of them are really screwed up. Our head mechanic, Jack Whitman, is a drunk and divorced and fighting with his kids. And Bob Purcell is a loose cannon on the ship. Stuff like that. He repeated that uh, Frank Lamb, remember the, the drug smuggler, uh owner of the business that his father had bought from was, you know, a huge criminal and all that. And asked, and when asked if his father had ever received death threats because of this, he said, quote, not that I know of. Something tells me he has before, though. And that's when Sousa then asked Dana, quote, and how about you and your folks? You ever have any disagreements? And Dana cut him off before Sousa could finish his question and said, quote, no, I mean, dad wanted me to go to school in London, but I was bored with school. I aced my classes and I felt I wasn't being challenged enough. I've been working on job offers in New York. That's where the action is. I have pictures of the stock exchange on my wall. You know, I got real interested in doing that stuff when I was young. They asked him how much mommy and daddy had given him to live on. Quote, okay, they don't give me so much per month. They give me a couple of credit cards and when I need stuff, books and stuff, I call him up and ask them to put some in the checking account. They asked if he knew anyone who would want his parents dead. Quote, dead? I don't know of any specific people. Tiffany's the most harmless creature in the world, but my mother's on the state bar. Dad's usually pretty calm, but once in a while he gets upset or gets in a lawsuit. Or like once we're trying to get a rack of lamb, he's driving all over Fresno, hitting all those stupid Fresno traffic lights, and he's kind of obsessed about this meat, and he's going nuts. 
I told him to calm down, and it was no big deal, but he's just trying to find this meat. But to answer your question, and that's when Sousa cut him off and said, quote, I have a question. Did you have anything to do with your parents' death? And Dana looked down at his lap, took a deep breath, you know, put his head back up, and said no. And even though he said this with, like, no anger or animosity or anything, Sousa did not believe him. And Burke asked Dana one more question before they concluded his second interview. And that was if Bob was part owner of Western Piper. And Dana said he was not aware if Bob had any shares in the company or not. After Dana, the detectives interviewed Rosa slash Juanita, remember the Ewell's housekeeper again, along with most of her family. And that was because, you know, she had a key. And it wouldn't be the first time, right, that a housekeeper had friends or relatives or someone who would steal their key and then, like, rob the the rich clients they cleaned for, right? So that's why they were, again, trying to eliminate every other motive for this crime. And uh, Rosa slash Juanita and all of her family, they all agreed to be questioned. They all agreed to be fingerprinted for, like, elimination purposes. And they were all very, very cooperative and helpful. And they were quickly scratched off of any suspect list. Now, later during that day, Sousa got a call, and his call was from someone named Peter Tapia, and he claimed his brother Mario had gone to school with Dana and knew him. Peter informed Sousa that Dana had been fascinated and enthralled with a man named Joe Hunt. He was a convicted murderer and leader of an infamous billionaire boys club. Peter said Dana had even gone so far as to write Joe in prison. And Joe even wrote back, but as soon as he realized Dana wasn't a woman, he stopped. Meanwhile, as uh, Sousa was taking that phone call, Detective Ibarra was at the crime scene at the Yule home, and she was with the uh, alarm company's technician. because they wanted to make sure there was nothing wrong with the alarm, right? The technician, you know, inspected and tested the system. It all worked perfectly. Everything was in order. And he said there was nowhere in the home that the alarm um, wasn't wired to, right? So, like, there was nowhere that you could enter or step foot in the home without the alarm sounding. And he said, like, even the skylights, which were already sealed off anyway, even they were wired up to the alarm. So if someone had come through the skylight, it also would have went off. And as he was about to leave, you know, the technician's at his van, and he he gave his thoughts in regard to the alarm to Detective Ibarra. Quote, looks like they forgot to set it, unless the guy that done it knew the code. But hey, how could he? Yeah. And with that, I will go ahead and end part one. I was going to do a little bit more, but uh, it is like really loud on my street right now. Uh, I live next to a small private airport. Funny that we're talking in the case, right? With like small airports and planes and stuff. And there's a bunch of planes and cars. So I'm going to stop here for part one and we will come back in two weeks and we will get further into this case. And I don't know if y'all are as enthralled with this case as I was, but like I just... I couldn't believe Dana, this little bitch. It gets so much more audacious, so much more. Thank you again to at hey hey you for suggesting this case. This one is definitely going to be one that sticks with me. And remember, quick reminder, this is the book that I got some of my information from, uh, Catch Me If You Can by Craig Hennedell. Um, yeah, I read it so you don't have to. Um, not a fan of this book at all. Not a fan of the writing at all. Um, get all into it at the very, 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 very end. Well, I guess I will uh, leave you to it. Um, hope you enjoyed the, the Star Wars set for the month of May. Uh, maybe I'll do something for June. Maybe, yeah, I don't know. Maybe. We'll see. Yeah, I hope you uh, have a great two weeks, and I hope you take care of yourself out there, and I hope you're not a dick when you go out there. Like, it's one thing when someone's, like, treating you like shit and, like, acting like a dick. Th- that's fine. But, like, don't go out of your way to treat people badly, right? Leave a little sparkle wherever you go. Alrighty, guys. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I will see you in two weeks. Bye-bye.